So I am uh, a broadcaster and journalist, and as Eleanor says, I've been banging on about plastics for a long, long time. But something very significant happened. My slides are rubbish, by the way, but I'm very enthusiastic, so you can just ignore them and concentrate on me. Um, but something very significant happened in October or November of 2017. David Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough spoke about plastics. Am I supposed to have turned this upside down, by the way? Yes. Otherwise, we'll all be here forever. And you'll have to use a dart gun or something. So, Sir David Attenborough spoke about plastics on Blue Planet 2, and suddenly, everybody realised we realise collectively that we are in living in the age of plastics, that we are experiencing a plastic pandemic firsthand. And when Sir David speaks, our ears prick up and we seem to sort of get it. So no longer did I feel alone. In fact, I felt quite overwhelmed, if I'm being completely honest. Suddenly, plastics was very much on the radar. And I've travelled the length and breadth of the UK looking at plastics, from both sides now, as Joni Mitchell would have put it, there are good plastics, like this plastic here, which provides this amazing environment, uh, helps to regulate the temperature and the Eden biomes, and will last for decades. And there are bad plastics. And some people would say there is no such thing as bad plastic. Plastic is just a material uh, which we personify to be good or bad. And actually, it's our usage of it which is incredibly weird. And this is so true because it, increasingly, especially in the UK, where we uh, are very dependent on supermarket culture and increasingly on online retail, we use an enormous amount of plastic. So each one of us uses about 139 kilograms of plastic a year. That's kind of 10 times the amount that a developing country would use. And that's despite the plastic uh, bag tax, levy on plastic bags, and all of those kind of um, uh, ideas, improvements. We're still using a huge amount of plastic. More plastic has been produced between 2002 and 2012 than at any other time in history. So we really are driving the plastic pandemic. We are globally producing about 320 million tonnes of virgin of new plastic from oil every year. And we're beginning to acknowledge and see the consequences. Now, one of the things we've been really, really focused on is marine plastic, so plastics going into the ocean. And this is because plastic, as we now know, has one core. Whatever type of plastic there is, and there are many different types, which I'll come to in a minute, which is very confusing if you're trying to recycle them, but plastic has one core attribute. It's pretty much indestructible. And I spent a really um, amazing day in the uh, chemistry labs at Leicester University a couple of weeks ago, setting fire to plastic, because I get paid for doing stuff like that. And it was really fun. And I set fire to chewing gum, which has got plastic in it. So when you're chewing chewing gum, for the first bit you're chewing, you're experiencing the flavors, the mintiness, the sugar, the sweetener. And then very quickly, you're basically just chewing a wadge of plastic. Um, and then you're absorbing nanoplastics, by the way. Um, but chewing gum, if you set fire to it, it just spreads. It's incredible. It increases its surface area. It's almost impossible to get rid of. So one of the things about plastic is that it's indestructible. So what do we decide to use it for? Single-use items. Isn't that an incredibly stupid thing to do? Because one thing you can guarantee about plastic is in whatever form, it'll be around for at least a couple of hundred years. Uh, the other thing that we now know about plastics in the ocean is that it doesn't melt away, it doesn't evaporate, but it does get smaller. And normally, when problems get smaller, they're easier to solve. Plastic, I would say, is the opposite. So, we've had to think quite a lot about what plastics are doing in the ocean and put them in the context of all the other ways that we are putting pressure on the ocean environment. And we have come to the conclusion that plastic is pretty significant. So, we know that plastic congregates in these amazing gyres, in oceanic gyres, clockwise gyres, uh, which were like vortexes. And we know that there's something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And I'm sure you've seen, there's lots of amazing adventurers and voyages. In fact, um, Emily Penn, the British explorer, is leading uh, a crew 
or completely, completely female crew who are going off to explore this gyre and collect evidence and more samples of plastic in the ocean very, very soon. And we know that, pl that plastic collects in these gyres. We also know that we're producing a huge amount of plastic year on year. And experts got really freaked out about the volume of plastic that we were producing. But there was one man, Professor Richard Thompson at Plymouth University, who looked at these figures, this was over a decade ago, and he thought, hang on, these are frightening figures, but they're too small. So he compared the plastic in the gyres with the plastic that's being produced, and he asked, where is the rest of it? And what his research led him to, and his research, by the way, is not glamorous research in the Galapagos Islands or in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. He has literally stood with a sieve in Plymouth Estuary which if you know Plymouth, it's not, it's not glamorous in the estuary, in all weathers, and he has collected samples of microplastics. So we now estimate that there's about 51 trillion microplastics floating in the ocean. And actually, they don't all float. We're, we're used to those images of rubber ducks and the plastic that we can decipher, like plastic bottles. We see those on the ocean. But actually what happens is that the microplastics get sucked into the water column. And they are potentially much more dangerous. So we know, we know from Blue Planet, we've seen large, uh, large animals ingesting those plastics. But they're also finding them their way into the food chain through zooplankton, who eat them instead of protein that they need to survive and reproduce. So it really is, in terms of Russian, environmental Russian roulette, plastics is really kind of dicing with death. It's pushing us right, 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 right to the edge, the brink of no return. And it's incredibly worrying um, for all of those reasons. So, as Eleanor said, I've been on the case with this for a very long time. So 2005, I spent most of it writing to a British or haranguing a British uh, retail ch chain, supermarket chain, for wrapping coconuts in plastic. Why do coconuts need to be wrapped in plastic? Because they obviously come with their own protective shell that Mother Nature has uh, awarded them. Um, and I thought I'd secured a sort of victory because after a while the supermarket said, okay, well, one of the excuses they used at first was that the fibrous hair on coconuts might be inhaled by children and therefore it's very dangerous and they must be shrink wrapped. So after a little bit of conversation about this, they eventually conceded that they would not wrap their coconuts anymore. I thought, great, what a victory. And then I got an email from another reader saying, they've just moved on to cucumbers. So I thought, my God, I'm going to spend the rest of my life just going through each fruit and vegetable group. Um, in the end, I think I kind of gave up. But recently, back on the trail of the plastic pandemic, I went into Waitrose, and this is what I saw. Not only are these shrink-wrapped, these coconuts, but they're on a special little chair, and they're stamped with genuine coconuts. What is a non-genuine coconut? This is what I would like to know. Uh, my life really has become uh, one great circuit of recycling and plastic reprocessing centers. So I spend a lot of time in PPE, protective equipment, and looking very attractive, as you can see, in a hard hat and goggles. But it's really, really interesting. And what we all now know is that recycling is not the big solution it promised to be. And we know that because China in January shut its gates um, and said no more of this unsorted low-grade waste. And that's affected the UK's recycling economy really, really badly. Because behind the scenes, 70% of our plastic waste, we were just happily shipping off, mainly to China, which was the biggest market in the world. Now that that market's not open to us, and they want only clean, clean plastic recycling, we are in a very, very difficult position. Don't worry, don't worry, we're told by policymakers, we'll just get better at recycling. Well, there isn't much evidence that we're going to be able to do that very quickly. It's incredibly expensive. We have, as everyone here will know, your friends, they have a different colour bin to you. They might have seven bins. It might take you a PhD to work out which bin 
your bottles should go in. We have tubs, we have trays, they're all different plastics, they're all different colours. Over the last year, I've met so many householders, some of whom were near to tears because they spend so long trying to sort out their goddamn plastic recycling. It should be so easy, it should be so easy, but it's not, except if you live in Wales. When people say to me, I want to be better at recycling, I say then move to Wales because Wales, Wales is killing it. Wales is second in the Global Recycling League. Very, very well done to them because they've invested, uh, they've standardised and they've done all the things that we know we need to do in order to improve our recycling. Elsewhere in the UK, I'm afraid we have not. So, you and I, we have to take action. We know we have to take action. And there is one thing that we can do. Stem the flow of plastic into your own life. It sounds really, really obvious, um, but it is really, really worth doing. And to reinforce this point, one of the great things that's happened post Blue Planet is that uh, we've been able to make loads of short films. Eleanor mentioned that I work for The One Show on BBC One. We've, we've done loads and loads on plastic to the extent that we recovered 8.7 tonnes of plastic waste from the Great Spring Beach Clean, which is headed up by Surfers Against Sewage, a very brilliant local NGO. Um, and we brought it all to London, to Broadcasting House, and we dumped it in front of the, the building. So we knew we were going to get fired or praised, we just didn't know which one it was going to be. Um, and we built a studio from the waste, and we presented the show from the pile of waste. And it was really, really great, honestly. It was such a thrill to do, which sounds really weird because I was sitting amongst very stinky waste because it, it, it smells really bad really, really quickly. But it was so obvious that our viewers connected with what we were doing. And they really, you know, they, they sent us so many messages and so many emails about how they had changed their plastic consumption. Um, but afterwards, I realised that I was actually responsible for recycling it all, which was another saga in itself. I think I managed to get 13% actually recycled into plastic flake, which will make new plastic objects um, and uh, fleece for clothing, that kind of stuff. The rest, it was very, very difficult. So we need a new approach. Instead of just re reduce, reuse, recycle, we need a whole different mantra um, and a whole different way of sorting out our approach to uh, plastic waste. We need to fall out of love with plastic, basically. Now, this is my friend Daniel Webb, who lives in Margate, and he decided that he wasn't going to try and recycle his plastic for a whole year. He was going to keep it in his house instead. So he collected nearly 5,000 bits of plastic over a year. Um, and that was everything that came into his life and his girlfriend's life as well. Lots of crisp bags by his own admission, which also are full of plastic and very difficult to recycle. And he kept it all. And what it shows us is how much of that would actually not be recyclable in, in usual, in a typical um, recycling facility. Because the truth is that increasingly, our plastic waste is burned. So we're using something that's made from oil, that links us to the fossil fuel economy, which is incredibly polluting to make, which is used for a matter of minutes, so 20 minutes maximum for a straw, which lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years, which can easily get into the ocean because around 50 items a year we're each responsible for getting into the ocean because our system is so overburdened. Um, and the real fact is that unless we take a stand, we're going to be facing a whole lot more. Over the last few years, $180 billion has been invested into new plastic production as a result of the uh, shale gas boom in the US. That plastic will go somewhere, and if we don't say no, it's coming for us. So we need to act now. So I've got really into reducing my plastic consumption. I've come up with a really complicated grid I, f I spent two weeks analysing our own plastic consumption in our household, where it came from, whether I had bought it, whether I'd asked for it. And the thing that I really found was that almost nobody ever buys a product for the plastic. It is being foisted on us. And this has been used again and again by retailers and by industry. 
And it's, we've, we've been using this as an excuse for so long. There are laws to protect us against overpackaging in the UK and, and these swathes of plastic that are coming into our lives. But usually the uh, retailer or the manufacturer will counteract that by saying the consumer demands it. So what's really exciting this time round is that the consumer definitely doesn't demand it. We are saying collectively, we don't want this and you need to stop it. Have you seen the amount of plastic protests, anti-plastic protests that are happening in supermarkets, for example, where people are literally ripping off the plastic and leaving it at the checkout? These are all really, really positive steps because we're actually saying no as consumers, and that will bring change. It's not the only change, but it will bring change. So I've helpfully distilled all my tips and tricks into this book, the aforementioned book, Turning the Tide on Plastic, which will be out um, 26th of July. You can pre-order if you want to. But I really believe the foreword for the book is written by Hugo Tagholm, who runs Surfers Against Sewage, based in Cornwall. And he makes the point, and I think it's a really, really good point, that the plastic pandemic is awful. We still have a lot of questions as to how we're going to solve it and when we're going to solve it. But it has done something extraordinary. It has brought people who would never usually be linked to environmental protest or activism. It has turned them into activists. Awareness has moved into activism. And collectively, we now have millions of people saying, we need this to change for us, but especially for future generations. So, when I'm asked, can we turn the tide on plastic, the answer is, hell yes, we can. Thank you.